If you read in the Old Testament, any time there was an idol in the camp, the idol had to be removed. we got to get rid of anything that stands in between us and knowing His presence is all around us, in us, and through us. Nothing. Like last week we talked about, no blockages in the heart. Just pure blood flowing through the heart. And he began to just like put this on my heart. And so a couple weeks ago, we started writing a message. I have three versions of this message typed out on my computer. I've been studying this for three weeks, and it's going to probably continue to be more forming in my mind. But I'm like, Lord, purity is such a tough word. How do you begin to talk about being pure and holy? Because really what purity is, is it's holiness. And so often we shrink back and say, well, I'm not that. No, nope, not me. I messed up. I have this. I have that. And we say, I'm not, I'm not. That's not me. I mean, I know I'm forgiven and I know I'm saved. But pure? Holy? Well, they said that I'm righteous, so I can, I can digest being righteous. Like, I'm his righteousness, so he's the righteous one. Not me. We go through these thought processes. Am I the only one? No. But he said, church, I'm calling you to holiness. I'm calling you to purity. And it's a purity that you cannot manifest on your own. It's a purity that you cannot create. It's a purity that you cannot serve into. It's not something you can do, 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 and then you're pure. No, it's actually part of the work of righteousness, part of the work of grace, part of the work of the cross. That Jesus paid for is your purity, your holiness, your sanctification is another big word we like to use. Go with me to Psalms chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. We're going we're to be using a lot of scripture today, so it will be on the screen, so just be ready. But the Lord also took me to Matthew 5 8, and his blessing is the pure in heart, for they will see God. I want to see him. Blessed is the pure in heart, for they will see God. These are Jesus' words. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Everything that we think, we're not. Blessed are you when men hurt you, when they say all kinds of evil against you. Blessed are you. Blessed are the pure in heart. So David, in Psalms 15, 1 through 2, he says, Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts. And then in Psalms 24, 3 through 4, it says, Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure and who do not, do not worship idols and never David knew that, that in order to be in the presence of God, you have to be in a place of pure heart. Yeah? He was called a man after God's own heart. And he said in Psalms, I forget what passage it is, that created me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Troy came to us a few weeks ago, and he's like, I just had a light bulb moment. I've been praying, created me a clean heart, when Jesus gave me a clean heart. It's already mine. So David, before the cross, knew that in order to be in the holy presence of God, that you had to have a purity of heart and thought and mind. Yeah? Yes. His presence is everything. And in order to enter his presence, we need to know what we actually are. We are righteous. We are blameless. We are holy. We are free. We are full of kindness, mercy, love, joy, peace, patience. That is who you are. Why? Because of Jesus. Amen? Amen. It's crazy to think that we have justified certain things in our lives because, well, I mean, it's just easier that way. I, it's, I'm human. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. There are so many passages of Scripture. We're only going to get into Hebrews today. But if you want more on this, go to First and Second Peter. Go to Colossians. Look at your identity through the eyes of Jesus and what he did for you. He made you holy right now. Well, that's cool, Leslie. It's 
the truth. And you can step into the most holy place today, now, whenever you have access to the heavenly realms, now. Not just when we get there, but now. Whew. We're going to tell you all about that as we continue on with the message. Today we are going to open a package a little more. We've been kind of unpacking this gift of salvation, of righteousness, of who we are in Christ. We're going to open the package a little bit more and we're going to look at holiness. We are as he is, 1 John 4, 17. So we are holy. Be holy as I am holy. Woof. You guys ready for this? We're going to go back to Leviticus chapter 16. So get ready for that, Pastor Chuck. How many Chip and Joanna Gaines fans do we have in the audience? <laughs> they are Leslie's favorite, yes. Who are they? Who are they? Okay. So they had a show for years on HGTV called Fixer Upper to where they would renovate um, homes for families who lived in their city of Waco, Texas. And they would fix them up. And then they would do the big reveal at the end. And these couples or individuals, they would get to walk through their newly renovated home. And it was just beautiful. And Joanna's an amazing designer and so very creative. Uh, they now have their own network, uh, the Magnolia Network, and basically their own empire in Waco, Texas. They have, you know, a cafe, a restaurant, uh, different shops, and they their heart is to see uh, their community thrive, to see others thrive in their business, and they're Christians, they're Christ followers. So that's at the heartbeat of everything that they do. Um, but God, the Father, is very creative as well. He's a designer. He gave Joanna Gaines her gifts for creativity and design. One of my favorite um, passages in the Old Testament in, in Exodus, I believe, is where God is giving Moses the designs for the tabernacle. And you think the Father isn't a detail-oriented Father. Read in Exodus all of the different materials and fabrics and dimensions and woods and everything, the metals, the gold, the bronze, everything that they needed. I mean, specific as specific can be when it came to the details for the tabernacle. And he gave these instructions to Moses to construct the tabernacle. And then in Leviticus chapter 8, God anoints Aaron, Moses' brother, as the high priest of Israel to serve the community. And then Aaron's family became, all became priests, his sons, and they were all anointed as priests. In the middle of the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies. There's a whole lot more I can get into here, but I'm trying to keep this quick. And Aaron, as the high priest, was the only person who had access to the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies contained the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God would dwell. And inside the Ark were the tablets, the, the rod of Aaron, the, the manna, uh, and on the covering for the Ark of the Covenant was called the mercy seat. And it's where Aaron would go in once a year and he would sprinkle the blood sacrifice on top of the mercy seat. Only once a year could Aaron go into the Holy of Holies to offer atonement. He would take the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice, and atone for all of the sins of the people of Israel. This was called the Day of Atonement. It was the greatest day of the year for the Israelites. Once a year, one person had access to the presence of God. One person. He was the only one that could enter the Hebrew word for atone means to cover. So when Aaron would offer these blood sacrifices, they wouldn't erase the sins of the Israelites. They would only temporarily cover them. They were ceremonially clean, but not spiritually 
cleansed from sin. On the day of the atonement of the high priest, Aaron would spend hours and hours getting ready. Husbands, how many of you can relate to someone spending hours and hours getting ready in the mornings? Don't raise your hand, Roy. <laughs> Saul came out. He's about to raise his hand. Amber, Amber, right back down. <laughs> no, this is nothing like us getting ready in the morning. Aaron would spend hours. He had to go through specific rituals and cleansing and clothing and preparation for what he could bring into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. The people would confess their sins to the nation and the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies to make atonement for them. Sacrifices and blood was shed so that the people's sins were covered. I hope you guys got your Bibles ready today because we're going to read some scripture. It's all on the screen so I'm going to move quickly though. And for the most part, I'm just going to let the Word of God speak for itself. I don't have to preach much today. <laughs> did somebody over there say amen? <laughs> I think somebody did. Okay, so Leviticus chapter 16, verses 2 through 6. This is on the screen. The Lord said to Moses, Warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain. Remember, there was a huge curtain that concealed the Holy of Holies. Remember, that curtain was torn when Jesus was sacrificed. Do not enter the most holy place behind the curtain whenever he chooses. If he does, he will die. For the ark's cover, the place of atonement, is there, and myself, I am present in the cloud above the atonement cover. When Aaron enters the sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. He must bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He must put on his linen tunic and the linen undergarments worn next to his body. He must tie the linen sash around his waist and put the linen turban on his head. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself in water before he puts them on. Aaron must take from the community of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron will present his own bull as a sin offering to purify himself and his family, making them right with the Lord. And it just continues and continues and continues. See, people's only access to God was through the high priest. Aaron spoke on behalf of God to the community of Israel. Millions of people. He was the mediator between God and man. And they were bound to an inferior law of works in order to maintain God's acceptance and approval. It was all about performance. It was all about the law. Following the law. Doing this right. Wearing this. Only eating these certain things. All of the, the rituals and the ceremonies and everything needed to maintain God's acceptance. Because a holy God cannot dwell with an unholy people. Righteousness and holiness, they were unattainable. Unattainable. So then we jump to Hebrews. Chapter, we're going to read the last verse of chapter 8 and then stick in uh, Hebrews 9 for a while. So many times in our lives we live, we, we live with a sin consciousness. When Jesus paid the highest price so that we can live with a righteousness consciousness. Well, that's what it was talking about. Okay, here we go. 8.13. This is on the screen as well. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. You know what the word obsolete means? Out of date. No longer relevant. How many of you have a VCR? <laughs> Can you go to Target or Walmart and buy VHS tapes? No, because it's obsolete. It's out of date. The old covenant that was established in the book of Exodus, the law, 600 and some laws then, that were added by the religious leaders, is obsolete. That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. I, I think right back when I read that verse to Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. 
And she says, you Jews say that you must go to the temple in Jerusalem to worship God. And Jesus says, oh, no, there is a day coming when you will worship the Father. Not on this mountain, not in this temple, but you will worship him in spirit and in truth. So the next few verses are basically verses 2 through 10, details about the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies. He's referring back to Leviticus. Details about the high priest and how the old pattern of worship with its external rules and ceremonies is insufficient. He continues in verse 11. Here's where it starts to get good. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 13. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonially, ceremonial impurity. Just like how, just think, how much more the blood of Christ will purify, there's our word, purify our consciousnesses from sin, deeds, from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Amen. Hallelujah. Go back to verse 13. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Covering. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify, not just cover. But purify, cleanse, make holy, sanctify our consciousness from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. Amen. Jump to verse 21. In the same way he, speaking of Moses, sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. If you read in Exodus, all the utensils, Everything that was crafted and created in the tabernacle had to be cleansed with blood offerings to purify them. It's kind of gross if you actually think about it for too long. <laughs> but it's what God required. Without shedding the blood, there could be no remission of sins. We can get into that more at a later time. Oh, it's the next verse. There we go. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven, I love this, he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again. Right. Like the high priest here on earth who must enter the holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. No, and if that had been necessary, Christ would have to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. It does not get any better than that. No. I want Jane Miller to kind of explain what is happening here. We see this picture being painted, but until we understand something here. This really doesn't come to a fullness of understanding in our minds how important this really was, the finished work that Jesus actually did here. Looking back at the Old Testament and what the high priest did once a year to cover the sins, to cover, 
pastor's already clarified that. It just covered their sins for one year. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So looking. And the scripture does not lay it out step by step. But there are hints. And this is my interpretation of what happened. Jesus was crucified. He died. And during that three days that he lay in that tomb, his body laid in that tomb, he ascended into hell. And he took the keys from the enemy of death, hell, and the grave. And he came back to earth. And we know the scripture says that Mary saw him outside the tomb. And he said, don't touch me. I haven't ascended to the Father yet. This is what I believe happened. Just like the Old Testament high priest took a bowl of blood into the Holy of Holies once a year, Jesus took a bowl of blood and he ascended to heaven and he stood before his Father. Imagine this. Close your eyes and imagine Jesus standing before the Father with that bowl of blood. That bowl of his blood. The blood he shed. The perfect Lamb of God. The Lamb without sin. And he said, here it is, Father. And then he moved into the Holy of Holies of heaven before the true Ark of the Covenant, and he sprinkled that blood on that Ark. Imagine that blood. 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years later, I picture that blood as still glistening and alive and red and full of power. It never loses its power. And because of that, because we come to the Lord and accept His sacrifice, that blood covers our sin. It's our redemption. It's our deliverance. It's our healing. Yes. It's our sanctity. It's everything for us because it's still alive yes. and powerful. In Jesus' name. Just as the high priest in the tabernacle would sprinkle the blood of an animal on the atonement cover and make atonement for the sins, Jesus sprinkled his blood. He purified the things of heaven once and for all once and for all, so that we could be forgiven, healed, and whole. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, for my sake, for Bradley's sake, for Lori's sake, for Stacy's sake, he made him, so the Father made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. The moment you say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Purify my heart. I confess you are Lord. I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead, you then become the righteousness of God. You become sanctified. You see, the cross is not the destination. The cross is the doorway. The cross is the beginning. The cross isn't where we stop. I love how Jonathan, David, and Melissa Helser, they say the Holy Spirit is the crescendo of the cross. That is the destination.
destination, the abundant life. That is the destination. We step through the finished work of Jesus on the cross into the Holy of Holies. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from most of our unrighteousness. Wait a minute. Okay, let's read that again. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. Now, now I like this though because Jesus did not just die to forgive your sins. It's part of it. It's a very important part. It's fundamental, but it's the beginning. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the finished work. If we dwell in the holy place, there must first be a holy place in our spirits where God dwells. If we will dwell in the holy place, there must first be a holy place in our spirits where God dwells. Amen. Pastor Mark Green, when he says a holy God can only live in a holy temple. This is bold. This may be stretching for some of you, but it is the truth of your identity in Jesus Christ. A holy God only lives in a holy temple. We casually say things like, the holiness of God and sin cannot coexist. But I'm a sinner saved by grace. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. You're contradicting yourself. If holiness and sin cannot coexist, then how can a holy God live in a sinner? Amen. He can't. Come on. We have been redeemed. Cleanse, sanctify. We are saints. Yeah. It says it all through scripture. It's who you are. It's who I am in Jesus Christ. No more sin nature. Yeah. You're no longer a sinner. You are the righteousness of God. You are a saint. Yeah. You are cleansed. You are holy. You are sanctified. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want you to imagine stepping into the Holy of Holies as Aaron did, having to wash yourself and put on the proper garments and the process. And, and anybody that stepped into the Holy of Holies that wasn't prepared died. They could not stand in the presence of God. But what I love about Hebrews chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, keep on reading 12, holy cow, the hall of faith. You keep on reading, but what I love is that he says it's, it's, you have access to the most holy place because you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ and you are made holy, so therefore you can be in the presence of God. And I love it because so often we, we put the, the, the law back on ourselves and say, but I can't be in the presence of God because I don't fit this, or I messed up here, I... The enemy wants you to stay powerless and ineffective. He wants you to stay thinking you are a sinner when you are free. It's not you anymore. This is, this is, this is what, what has to digest through our minds of what Jesus did in Hebrews 10. I'm going to go to verse 9 and 10. We don't have to keep putting the law on each other and saying, well, you... Is the law just more comfortable because it gives us guidelines? Who likes rules? <laughs> Who likes order, right? So we're going to do it this way, this way, this way, this way, and this way. And so we, we slip back into the law and the comfort of the law that it gives us because I know this is my wall and this is my wall and this is my wall and this is my wall. When, when Jesus came, he blew up the walls. He said, you don't have to think about the walls anymore. You don't have to worry about the walls. The walls are not existing to you. You are free indeed. The blood paid the price for you not to just not, not just to be forgiven of your sin, but it says to be forgotten. The sin, your sin is forgotten as far as these is from the West. He does not remember it anymore. So it's not a one-year cleansing or not a weekly repentance. 
It's good news. Yeah. Go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. We're kind of continuing on from chapter 9 into chapter 10. We couldn't just give you 9 and not give you 10 because, oh boy. He cancels the first covenant. This is the end of verse 9. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. Amen. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all time. Amen. That is a power-packed sentence. For God's will was for us to be made holy. Yes. You're holy. Holy cow! You're holy! <laughs> you are holy. You are righteous. You are blameless because of Jesus Christ's blood sacrifice that he went into the most holy place and poured on the altar so that you can walk free. Free. Once and for all time. Done. When Jesus said, it is finished. His blood had been poured out. The sacrifice of his blood was finished. That means we don't have to pay. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around not having to pay for something that's the best news ever. But I owe you. I feel like I don't deserve this. How can I be free when I mess up so bad? And you're saying, I don't have to do anything except receive what you're giving me? And I stand in the most holy place? Yes, that's what he's saying. It's too good to be true. But I want you to digest that in your spirit today. You are his righteousness. You are holy as he is holy. You are free. Yes. You are as he is. And God is not a liar, nor is he a promise breaker. Hmm? That's right. This is his word. That's right. Verse 19 in chapter 10. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I'm like, oh, have I? Have I boldly entered heaven's most holy place? What does that mean? We no longer worship in a tent made with human hands. The Holy of Holies has been birthed within you. And you get to step into the presence of the Most Holy God in holiness and righteousness where before you would just be dead because His presence is too great. But He made you holy and you get to access the Holy of Holies every single day. I was so convicted when I read this because sometimes we lose our confidence that God is with us, He's for us, He's doing. Holy cow, we get to be in the Holy of Holies every day. We get to access the most holy place, Jesus, right here. Yes. The kingdom is in you. Yes. The most holy place is in you. Yeah? Yes. I mean, it's what the Bible says, and I think it's true. I'm going to read that last part. Enters heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Was the blood sufficient yes. for you? Yes. To forgive you of anything you've ever done? Yes. yes, it is. It is sufficient. By his death, verse 20, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. I, I, I wanted to, I, I felt like this isn't it. Let, let's go. You want to go? Let's go right into His presence. We don't have to work up to getting His presence to be here. We get to go right into His presence because of the blood of Jesus, because you are His righteousness, because you are holy as He is holy. Stop! Oh, stop shorting God. He wants you in his holy presence. He wants you full and empowered. He doesn't want you lazy on the couch. He wants you in his presence. Do not cut him short. Well, God didn't do this for me. Well, have you been in his presence? Because you have full access to it. Stop making excuses and being a powerless believer when you have all the power. You have all the authority because of Jesus Christ. No more 
He paid far too great a price to live in a pit. That's right. To live in a pit. I did not. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts. I'm desperate for his presence. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. You are pure. You are clean. Don't let the enemy lie to you anymore. Let us hold tightly, verse 23 without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. Numbers 23, 19. Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to add acts of love and good works and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is Righteousness and 